various aspects of uh, uh, compilers, uh, programming languages, uh, lower level optimizations, uh, uh, mid level optimization, uh, debuggers, runtime systems. And I've worked on various uh, projects uh, earlier at IBM, we worked at several projects, uh, and then uh, subsequently uh, at Vice University, uh, Extreme State Software Research Lab, uh, and now at uh, uh, Georgia. The uh, ACM fellow and actually fellow that are based in the region of the street. So we are pleased to have him again here and his talk is on a slightly uh, different uh, subject this time. Uh, it is uh, on the productive and scalable actor based uh, programming system for uh, free gas applications, particles, and global enterprise space applications. So uh, again, thank you for uh, agreeing to the, uh, your talk here and look forward to it. Uh, thank you. There's always such a pleasure to be here. I had the opportunity be, to be here a year ago when I um, spoke about some compiler related work on, for Python that we were working on, which is still continuing. But this work that I'm talking about, even though it started with earlier, it's picked up with a major project only since last September. So really happy to share. Just want to confirm people on Teams can hear audio and see the slides fine. And also, more importantly, like you see the slides advance. Is there anyone on teams? I'm not sure. Yeah, but anyway, you, you can let me know if there are any issues on team. Uh, please feel free to make this informal and interactive. So uh, this is a general motivation that for all of us who work on programming models, compilers, runtimes, that uh, there's so many disruptions happening with the end of Moore's law. And there's a very urgent need for new programming systems, which means new languages, compilers, runtimes, debuggers. Uh, because in the old case, when you just had, say, simple multi-core, multi-core and vector, there were some approaches based on libraries that seemed to mainly do the job for developers, but things have become so heterogeneous that just standard library approaches cannot keep up for various reasons. Um, and add to that, so what I mean, my comments earlier were for people who are more like high-performance computing experts. But add to that the fact that we have domain experts. Uh, so of course, I think all of you are familiar and you have work going on in the machine learning domain. In fact, when I was here last May, you had started a class or something where you were co-teaching, so I'm sure. Uh, but maybe for a change, I'm going to not talk about machine learning and I'll talk about uh, graph analytics. And in graph analytics, there are a lot of challenges in terms of the need to try to analyze large graphs for a variety of uh, uh, applications, science-oriented applications, social network analysis applications, even things like uh, homeland security applications and so on. So this is going to be the focus of my talk and the challenge is how to meet the challenges there. And one reason this is so challenging is, okay, this is a very detailed plot. What is it? The x-axis has years going from 1994 to about a couple of years ago, well, 22. Um, each data point represents an actual performance submission by some computer system over the world. The red bars are the famous top 500 HPL metric. The y-axis is performance in giga ops per second. So for each HPL, it means giga flops per second. So you can see in the top 500, for example, and it's on a, a log scale, so each interval is a factor of 10. Uh, you know, over the years, uh, nearly uh, three decades, uh, computers have uh, uh, progressed in a way, especially at leading edge supercomputers, where they could continue to deliver high performance for this regular scientific oriented codes, floating point intensive code. And recently with AI, there's this uh, benchmark HPL AI that uses mixed precision. And those are blue dots where you can get uh, uh, performance even higher over there in that space. So, you know, so computers have been, we've had this recent exascale computers in the US, the first one was Frontier at Oak Ridge Lab, and these were measured using this metrics. 
However, what this chart also shows is some metrics for other benchmarks. And these are just benchmarks for applications and even bigger challenges. Uh, high performance uh, conjugate gradient. So that's a sparse application. But uh, when you go to really graph applications, so that's HPCG. So you can see that these yellow dots uh, in terms of ops per second are one to two orders of magnitude below what you get from uh, regular dense matrix computation. But if you go to SPART, uh, graph applications, and they can be modeled as matrix operations, but highly, highly sparse matrix operations. Uh, we see we have the green dots, which are breadth first search, and the blue dots, which are single uh, source shortest path. Um, and here you see that the performance is, I mean, look at this for SSSP, it's like five orders of magnitude. Of course, here the metric is different, it's not drops. It's usually something like traverse stages per second text. But in terms of capability to the end user, uh, you can say that today's hardware runs at you know 0.01% lower efficiency uh, for these applications. So this is a fact. I mean, into how especially high performance computing has advanced, it's really been biased by these regular applications and has served these regular applications well. All of you know so many science applications that have helped uh, advanced different uh, scientific domains that have benefited from it. Uh, but here, there's a very significant gap. Yes, uh, go ahead. I don't know exactly where the submission is. Yeah, so I, they, all I do know, and this was, I should have said it, um, one of my colleagues on the new project that I'm going to mention is Peter Kogi. He's been collecting this data over the years. My understanding is that BFS is from five, uh, graph 500. SSSP, I'm not sure, but I do know that these are all official submissions. None of this represents a data point that we've measured. They all correspond to reported data reported by others. So the question is, are they, does any of this hardware represent graph accelerators? I think these Probably not because these are submissions by standard supercomputing centers, just like yours, you know, with based on hardware that they achieve. So it's uh, there may be one or two of those, but that actually is the motivation for our project as well. And we, those are the kinds of things we need to use as comparison for our project. Okay, more questions? Were there? You know the top 500 submissions? Yes, the red ones. Are the red ones are the top? Yeah, for HPL. Oh, I see. Is a high performance lens gap and then that. Uh, but the other submissions are not from uh, the HPL, but obviously. Yeah, there's there's the HPCG. Systems. I mean, if you've heard Jack, Jack Dongera talk recently, he's been talking about HPCG as sparse matrix as one step a little broader than HPL, which is dense matrix. So, so but they're all official submissions. So, if you go to the supercomputing, various supercomputing websites, you find reported numbers for these. So all of this was collected by publicly reported data. But they're not perhaps the same systems, right? Oh, no, they're, they're not necessarily the same system. This is a comment, this is just a comment about the state of the art as to what capability we can obtain with systems that people have, you know, available to them as supercomputers today. For example, are the top five hundred systems they cannot have even run here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. One system they cannot have yeah. Exactly. I think if you look at just a top system like uh, Frontier, yeah. uh, if you look to see all of them on the Frontier, uh, what else do you Oh, sure, thank you. All of these run on the Frontier. Yeah, we only two of them. Yeah. yeah. So, right, right. And later on, we are talk we've been actually obtaining the results in earlier on Summit and Perlmutter. And what we will see is that these four or five orders of magnitude, my claim is some of this can actually be bridged by software which means that you can actually use today's hardware more efficiently with software models, and that's why we're very excited about our work at the actor runtime, but not all of it. We can, like maybe one or 1.5 orders of magnitude, 10 to 100x will come from software, but the remaining gap will need hardware, which is our new project, a hardware innovation. And all of these benchmarks continue to use C, OpenMP, MPI, not even perhaps. I, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, it could even be CUDA. It could be CUDA for sure. Yeah, yeah. 
And certainly this HPL AI, the topmost points are definitely, you know, like when NVIDIA introduced mixed precision and all. So there's an argument that we had already reached XS scale a couple of years ago with mixed precision, but the red dots are true 64-bit protein factor. So yeah, this is, uh, I'm really glad that this sparked discussion because the intent of it, this is certainly not our research, it's just to report on the state of the art based on data that other people have reported. Okay, but this gives you an idea of what we want to focus on. Again, remembering this is a log scale, we're talking about many orders of magnitude gap over here. And uh, there was one paper from, uh, that's in uh, TPDS, I think from 2017, that did, just looked at data analytics in general, not, not necessarily graph analytics, but irregular data analytics, and uh, pointed out that for various hardware performance monitors and all, hardware resources were being highly, highly underutilized by these applications. So you can look at, and I'll also show later for some more recent uh, hardware performance monitors data we uh, collected. So, you know, in terms of uh, CPI, uh, use of unutilization of execution ports, the fact that it was memory bound versus core bound, all of these things. So this is an, it's an indicator that uh, to sort of validate the results, it's not giving the root cause, but it's like showing the correlation that the performance is below and these resources are being used poorly. So to my point about domain experts, uh, some of you may have seen me show this inverted pyramid of, uh, and I also believe this is in log scale, to show that we have these HPC experts that are often referred to as ninjas, they're the ones when some new hardware comes out uh, in the early days of GPUs and even the cell processor and all. So they understood the hardware and they could figure out how to program it. And today for machine learning accelerators, uh, through some like low level C code and intrinsics that are really tied and specific to the hardware. And, uh, and actually as we go through this uh, extreme heterogeneity phase, more and more, many features of new hardware features are first exposed in that way. Uh, then we have people who uh, actually do a really lot of important work in terms of developing libraries and frameworks uh, that can build on these low level intrinsics and kernels to uh, provide some APIs that could then be used by a domain expert. And this has certainly been very helpful in machine learning. So, you know, PyTorch and TensorFlow and all are examples of that. And then we have domain experts who want to express new parallel algorithms. One of the challenges they face is they can use something available in an existing framework if it matches their needs, but they want to innovate. This is certainly true for graph algorithms and even in machine learning because they may have different trade-offs with uh, precision, response time, coincidence, all of that kind of thing. And if, uh, if what they have, we've even seen it in some recent work for things like operator fusion, for tensor computations, um, where we have paper last year in fact, and we have a submission this year, um, where uh, you know the libraries can maybe provide fused operators for pairs, but sometimes the best solution might require fusing five operators, and the combinatorial space becomes so large that the library developers cannot keep up. So another challenge for domain experts is, well, all of you are familiar with different levels of parallelism, but if you, and this relates to what I mentioned a year ago about uh, Python programmers, you know, when they write their analytics, they might have a basically a single CPU model. Even in Python, getting to multi-core doing Python multi-processing is a leap. And then talking about accelerators and certainly host to device data movement, there are libraries that help, Kupai and so on, but they're challenges. And then cluster programming is probably like a huge cliff. You know, at that point, they just give up and maybe hire a bunch of ninjas to re-implement. I've seen this many times, re-implement their Python code in HPC, C, and so on. Okay, so with all that backdrop, uh, there are two things. I've spent most of my time, um, I'm going to leave a copy of, of my slides with, uh, with there as well. So you have, that's why I included all these details. Uh, there's like three papers related to the first part of talk. In the last five to ten minutes, I'll talk about this new uh, hardware related uh, project uh, where we're doing hardware software co-design to bridge uh, the gap for graph algorithms. 
So one way to sort of look at some of those issues being faced by uh, regular applications is that uh, classically for cluster parallelism, uh, that we've had this model for many decades called BSP, bulk synchronous parallelism. And um, it was actually very useful. I mean, I remember the grad student studying when it came out, and that time people were also still thinking, oh, we should be able to make a scalable shared memory multiprocessor, the, the ultra computer, the RP3, and all of that. But this model said, if you can structure your algorithm in a way where you have phases of local compute, followed by phases of communication and synchronization, you could argue both theoretically, and it was validated in practice, that you can get scalable parallelism. So it was called bulk synchronous with the idea that to remind people that for this to scale, you have to have sufficient uh, local work in each phase to amortize all the overheads of synchronization and communication. Uh, this was actually even the foundation of MPI. Of course, it got tweaked with point-to-point -point message and all, but this was basically the main philosophy. And also each processing element was a processor memory pair. So it was like a processor and local memory, and so you had to communicate. And so this idea is that your whole algorithm was a sequential composition of super steps. In some sense, you know, a decade ago, in big data, people were looking at map reduce. Basically the same idea where the map phase is local and the reduce phase is the communication and maybe like collective operations. And um, and even some theoreticians reasoned about algorithmic complexity for this. Uh, our observation is for these irregular graph algorithms, and you can even take something like simple as page rank or something. You can divide it up into phases, but this idle time, uh, depending on how you set up your communication, either the synchronization will occur too frequently or uh, you end up doing some redundant work. Either way, you have overheads that are very, very significant. So the key motivation for the, this work that I'm going to talk about um, is that we somehow need to add asynchrony to this bulk synchronous uh, model. So we are proposing something that we call this fine grain asynchronous bulk synchronous. We still want to, at the highest level, retain phases and barriers and collectives and reduces reductions of cluster. These are things that can be done very well, and we don't want to replace all of that by asynchronous interaction. But uh, the main, so we retain all of that, but the main extension is one is while we have processor memory pairs, uh, we have this partition global address space that you may have come across, I'll say a little more, where you can have an uh, any processor can access a remote location as well through some address translation. So instead of it being, you know, pure message passing, there's no visibility of addresses across the PE. Here in the PCAS model, you have the visibility, and in particular, you have efficient forms of doing that address translation. Um, the other thing is you have active messages, which are asynchronous point to point. So for example, over here, PE2 sends a message to PE0, and I'll show you examples in a bit. That message carries data, but it also has an encoding of, a, you can think of it as an opcode for a message handler. And I'll also share with you the details. Some combination of runtime software and hardware will ensure that at some point after the message is received, the receiver does not have to perform any receive operation, or even polling or anything that the, the the runtime or hardware combination will take care of it. At some point later, and that's what the red bar represents, you can think of it as a little task gets executed uh, that represents the uh, message handler that needs to be performed with that data. And this active message, the idea of active messages has been around in different ways. You can also think of it either coarse grain as RPC or GasNet has very limited forms of active messages. These are pretty general. Within an active message body, you can create new active messages. So if you have a chain of dependencies, you can actually, uh, with, with data being operated in P, now the whole motivation for this, instead of performing all the uh, this uh, compute on PE2, is to, um, one phrase that people use is move compute to data instead of moving data to compute. So if, 
as part of this logical computation, you need to work with some data on PE0. You send an asynchronous actor message, so that work gets done with local data accesses. And then, because of this, you can still, even though it's asynchronous, this chain of dependencies is still preserved uh, because of the happens before ordering uh, of this end and so on. And uh, you could have a multicast also. You could be uh, sending active messages to multiple receivers. Um, and so active messages uh, can include parameters from the source PE, but they can operate on data on the receiving PE. Uh, and they can recursively send new active messages. And uh, the PGAS collectives, uh, a key extension over here is that this extended barrier not only waits for all the blue local computes to complete, but it also waits for all the active messages that are, have been initiated to complete. So there's a lot of bookkeeping that needs to be done because they're all asynchronous to make sure they've been initiated received and the message handler has been executed. But with that, there's a huge convenience because uh, sometimes people refer to these uh, active messages as fire and forget. Well, you don't want to completely forget. You need to know after the barrier that they've all been completed. Otherwise, you don't know what state your computation is. Okay, so that's a high level idea. We had a conference paper earlier, but we had this more recent journal paper uh, with uh, details, but any questions at this level before I get into a little more detail? Yes, question, Kinshu. So, let's say in this example, when you are sending an active message. Yes. Whatever we do for executing it would just look at and then. Ah, so I'll talk about how that runtime preemption works. Uh, right now, uh, what we have is because we don't have special purpose hardware, we have only a software only solution. But in the new project, we have hardware support. In the software-only uh, solution, uh, the runtime does this interleaving, and I have a slide later, and it does it at predefined points. So if you want, you can think of these as transactions also. And so if you have multiple asynchronous messages going to the same PE operating in the memory data, they actually get serialized. And you have you may have the option of running them in parallel, but one simple approach, which has worked well for us, is you serialize them within a single runtime thread and you don't need extra synchronization of it. So the messages that you're sending are not actually, but the original computation that is happening in the scheme, yeah. that is not from actually Right, right, right. So there, yes, that's a good point. And uh, I'll show you in a moment, it turns out that for many of these graph algorithms, the original code is just initiating these active messages and then waiting, And but if it's actually doing, it can also send an active message to itself, so that so it could be a unified model. But if it actually wants to do some careful interleaving of it, the sequential execution of the blue and all, then that's getting to be a little more like a ninja programmer. We have some specific operations like yield and all that can, uh, like cooperative multi-threading that can help control that, where, how that context switching occurs. Yes? So, I mean, unless there is like a, Structure to this communication. It looks like uh, these are very hard to debug if they're being these messages are being done uh, sent manually by the programmer as opposed to someone auto generating this kind yeah, of so, yeah. And how do you, uh, is there a deterministic uh, order which can be used to replay or, uh, I mean, for any, you run it once, you run it uh, all the time. Uh, is there a, a deterministic serialization of what these things that can be uh, constructed? Right. So that's yeah. a very, very interesting topic question about debugging, which I'm happy to engage. We started because we have separate work on fault tolerance and checkpointing and all. And we're trying to. Uh, so a couple of things. One is that when you compare with MPI, you have some of the same issues with message passing. That's one. Second is yes, there is a way to do deterministic replay. You can for debugging mode. Uh, where you could find some ways of tagging or numbering the messages and always replaying them because the runtime is controlling the order in which. On the flip side, um, if the computation is intended to be deterministic, we also do this. Is, you can think of it as fuzzing in the runtime. To help debug the program, we can reorder the uh, way messages are executed to flush out some bugs. For example, we can try to or uh, execute the messages 
as close to a reverse order as possible as dependencies will allow. And we find that that's a great heuristic of flushing out some bugs because, uh, you know, people can just run their code repeatedly and get the same answer. But so there are two ways. One is fuzzing like approach, which is not uh, um, full scale. I mean, it's uh, uh, testing and debugging. And the second is replay. Uh, we are also exploring. We've done a lot of separate work in our group, but not for this on deterministic checking for multi-threaded programs. Like we have a paper this year for doing it with promises and so on. Uh, in the same line of work that Licenses Group has done in Silk and so on. And we're trying to see how that would apply. But so far, our feeling is it's certainly no worse than what people are faced with with MPI, and we're trying to find it. Now, the holy grail that we've got some early work, and this is my colleague, June Shirako, is how can a compiler, and I'll show you a code example a bit, take a logical BSP code which in some ways is simpler for the programmer to write, even though it's inefficient, and automatically generate this actor code. And we have some initial progress over there that's very exciting. So, why can't, sorry, yeah. why can't these are deterministic programs or non deterministic basically? No, I mean, write, uh, I'll, basic programs. you could. I mean, is, well, they won't be technically, it won't be a data race, so it will be non deterministic because. There could be two asynchronous messages from P, P1 and P2 going to P0. In some executions, the order and the whole benefit of asynchrony is that you can leverage, uh, for example, in our new hardware project, we have uh, our project partners include Cornelis Networks. It's a small company that used to do Omnipart in Intel. Uh, they have adaptive routing. So two messages with the same sender and the same receiver could be executed in different orders and this model allows for that. So the algorithm needs to be robust. It turns out that the graph algorithms are very robust with respect to those kinds of determinism. Uh, so, and uh, ultimately, so for example, if you take, uh, also how do you define um, determinism, right? In machine learning, they've really lowered the bar for determinism, right? Accuracy above 80% is, is a deterministic. But even for something like single source shortest path, for two executions, you could uh, report two different shortest paths. And you can also traverse your neighbors in whatever order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what I'm trying to say is that for the graph algorithm domain, this non-determinism is a good match. For It may be a little more challenging for some other application domains. Yes, but... Uh, each one is what, sorry? Yes, you can think of it that way. Our runtime implements. I have to get into a little bit of the actor model. So, okay, why don't I get to the next level of detail? Because it's still, still very much the high level model. I actually, uh, so I also want to say that this, the our path to the actor model came from this idea of thinking about asynchronous uh, computing for a long time. Uh, when I was at IBM, we worked on the X10 project and the idea of asynchronous statements, which was remote. Um, uh, you know, send an asynchronous task somewhere. It's basically like it's sending an active me message. So, uh, and the idea that, you know, there's been decades of work of relaxing barriers to point-to-point -point synchronization, data flow, DAC parallelism, do across uh, futures promises. And these are all, in our opinion, moving towards this fine-grained asynchronous uh, model. Okay. So in terms of, uh, and please stop me after in a few minutes if you don't uh, get to answer your question. So how do we realize this model? So I postulated that this could be good for uh, this uh, these problems. One is this actor model that was created initially for fault-tolerant distributed computing, not for scalable HPC. Uh, we've extended that to enable, uh, you know, extending these classical actors, and then we have something called selectors that we had worked on my group many years ago, where you have multiple mailboxes. And uh, we also do this automatic termination detection that I mentioned, which in the classical actor model, if you want to do that, you'd have to have some consensus protocol to figure out that all the actors are terminated. Another key thing that we do is the logical messages in these applications, and I'll show you some examples, are very, very short. Uh, some of the graph algorithm designers say, think like a vertex, things like an edge. One vertex sends a message to another vertex. The message length is, can be 16 or 32 bytes. 
obviously we're not going to inject 32 bytes at a time in a high performance in interconnect whether it's infinite band or Aries or whatever. So one thing we do in our software is we do automatic message aggregation to uh, collect a whole bunch of messages to, for the same destination. And this could be like in the thousands, uh, depending on, you know, with the ideal packet size of 64 kilobytes or megabyte or whatever, and then uh, unpack it at the other end. Uh, for that, we, uh, there's some people we uh, research, collaborators we work with, they have a library called conveyors. So we use that under the covers to help with that. And then we have our, our own runtime that does this context switching. Um, and this is work that's been underway in my group uh, called the Hardener C library. Uh, so this is how we're getting to it. Uh, this idea about uh, multiple mailboxes, this is a paper from like 10 years ago almost, um, is that the classical actor model, you send messages to one mailbox. Uh, what we do with multiple mailboxes is each mailbox has its own message handler. One advanced capability is that we can um, enable or disable mailboxes. So if a mailbox is disabled, what happens is the runtime will never execute the message handler for that mailbox. It can still keep receiving messages. And then this can be very good for certain, in, in that paper we show kinds of coordination where you could say, okay, you want to pause on executing messages of a certain type till you get some notification of a certain type and so on. Uh, and uh, now to get to your uh, thing is that, yes, each PE is an actor. Now what is actually a PE? In a, the performance results I'll show you in a bit. Each PE is basically implemented as a, you can think of it as a POSIX thread running our runtime code. Uh, and so typically mapped onto one hardware core. So that's what we are calling a PE right now. In some other cases, if the body of the active message needs to use multiple cores, we could have multiple cores in one PE. Let's get to make it really concrete with code. So this is like a hello world example. And this happens to be in our C++ API, which uh, you can use, I'll sure give you the link, anyone can download it and try it out. Uh, and if you want access to a source code also, you can certainly let me know. Um, so here, it's an HPC SPMD program. That means each PE starts the same main program over here somewhere. And um, it's, uh, it's allocating an actor. Right now, we tie one actor, hopefully this will help answer your question, to one PE thread. And it's doing some send, non-blocking send, to another PE, which is identified somewhere. For example, it could be doing some histogram calculation. You say, I found an event. Now, there's so many counters, they don't fit in one PE's memory. They're distributed across PE memory. So send a message to another destination PE to perform some work like increment some memory location over there, which, um, and uh, there are two ways of doing it. Uh, you can specify the body of the message using a C++ Lambda. I'll show you an example of that. Or you can specify it using an explicit message handler. If you do it a Lambda, it's kind of like the message handler is implicit. So in this case, we have the uh, increment message handler. So the idea is that the, this is a non-blocking send. So the programmer does a bunch of sends and is done. It indicates that it's done sending messages in the current phase. And then at this point, when there's a barrier, uh, all the messages from all the PEs that are in flight, each one, and you can see the amount of work, the amount of data being sent, and the amount of work in each message is really, really tiny. You're just sending, uh, and uh, you know, just the index of the counter that needs to be incremented and the amount of work. So the aggregation is very, very key over here. Does that help answer your question about the PDF? Yeah. So this, yeah, so task parallelism is really, really caught on. It's something that uh, I'm pleased to see catch on because I've had the opportunity to work with it for many decades. You can think, so think of this as a remote asynchronous task or as a non-blocking RPC. But the granularity of overheads, like if you did an RPC like this, 
you know, in any system today, it will run a million times slower than even the sequential version just because of the overheads involved. So I think the concept is not new and uh, the actor, the object oriented community, like in languages like Scala, they have uh, an actor model and all it's been around. But this idea that's been designed for high performance computing, you could run it on thousands of nodes and in a way that's scalable. We are showing that that is possible, which people had not really explored much before. Yeah. I didn't spell that out because I'm I'm sorry. I've, I've been assuming a pre uh, assuming background which I don't think I've included slides for. So the partition global address space, which can be enabled by hardware support or can be done purely in software as well, takes the the local memories and gives a way of addressing it. So that's what we use. And then it all becomes a question of you know are you using some combination of compiler hardware support to make the global to local translation uh, efficient? You assume underlying. Yeah, 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 that's right. Okay, uh, was there a question on the back or no? King Shop, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Now, PE1 might also be changing this and that can be to databases. So, I guess there is some. Yeah, so I think this is related to your earlier question. So, I think think of a single thread and I'll show you. There'd be well defined context switch points, this is like cooperative multi threading where. Uh, you know, you have multiple threads running on one processor, like with the yield operation. So it's not like uh, uh, you think of these are non preemptive regions. It's not like any point can be arbitrary. I'll show you how the runtime decides when to do it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity for automatic parallelism. What we found so far for these graph applications for the data I show is that even by running each actor thread sequentially in a PE, there's enough parallelism. We just divide up the data structure. In fact, uh, in many cases, there could be 64 PEs, depending on how many cores in a node. And they're only accessing 164th of the memory, but it is almost as though they were 64 independent processor memory pairs to some extent uh, for these applications. Yeah. So, and to a point that I made earlier, you can do a request response where in the body of the message handler in PE1, there could be a response also, which is asynchronous. So, uh, you can, which so here's one example of this pattern. This is I'm really getting into the actual code over here. It's a very simple thing. So uh, there's a set of benchmarks, very simple, uh, but uh, our partners were interested in these kind of problems. This is open source thing called Bale kernels. Even though it's very simple, uh, they believe that any combination of software hardware that can uh, execute these kernels efficiently will probably work very well for irregular graph analytics applications. So what is this one doing? So this is some of you may have come across UPC and you can think of it as PGAS. It's the simplest kind of where each PE in this version is doing just trying to gather data. Here, index and gather are local arrays and data is a shared distributed arrays, you know, block cyclic or something. And uh, there's a reason to collect together some data with some specified indices together so you can work it. So logically for the programmer, um, and this relates to a point uh, that I made earlier, they can just write the code this way. You can think of it as open MP code also, that where each thread is. The challenge with this is this would be that four orders of magnitude inefficiency when run on a cluster, because each load here, at least by default, would be a black blocking load, which would take tens of thousands at, at least cycles to come, and you have a lot of idle time. 
Um, this is what the, I'll tell you a little bit about, this is what the active version looks like, uh, which may not be as intuitive, but it's certainly more, I think, usable than an MPI version. It says that each PE, what it'll do is it'll send the request, it's a request response pattern. It sends a request, and here I'm now showing the Lambda notation instead of the, uh, uh, the explicit uh, message handler method. Uh, so this, this body in lines 31 to 33 is the message handler for the request. In the request, what happens is they're loading some data, and yes, there's some details about how does one PE know about the address of a second PE. For example, the Schmidt PCAS model has a notion of a symmetric heap where the local addresses are the same across all PEs. Um, it executes its code, gets the data, and then it has an embedded send, and it has a nested lambda to say that when the data is received, you can store it in the target array. So you can imagine that if there are disjoint elements for the target array, all of this is happening in flight. You don't care whether the target array that, uh, you know, the, over here, the target array is this gather array, whether uh, element two comes first, or element zero comes first, all you care is after that, all the, the data is gathered. So this is an example of how, how it would work. This stuff, not to get into detail, because I'm running out of time, is the conveyor library I mentioned. This is really ninja level, it delivers great performance. But here the programmer is working with the message passing at a very low level. There's one so-called conveyor object for the request, one for the response. Each conveyor API can fail, you have to take correct, you have to do push, pull, check for break. It's like two nested while loops. To achieve. Hello, uh, can I ask yeah. a question? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is Raghavan uh, Vivek. So this, uh, yeah. the yeah. send, uh, what is the third parameter of the send? Uh, over here, the third parameter is a lambda. So it's this whole thing starting with the square bracket equals. Oh, you can't, okay, uh, you can't see where I'm pointing, but uh, in, in, in line 30, you see the square bracket equals? I can use the mouse, okay. Well, I, I can, yeah, I, I'm following you. Yeah. yeah, so third parameter is the lambda, I think. Uh, did that help answer your question? Right, but who's going to execute the lambda? Ah, that's the runtime. I'm going to come to that. <laughs> that, that that's related to some earlier No, the question is, is the, is the receiving actor going yes. to receive that? Right, that's the whole point about this model, is that on the receiving side, there's going to be some computational support, which right now for us is all in software, and the future will be software plus hardware, to take care of receiving the message and invoking the message handler. So the message handler is sent along with the message, is it? Is that well, not exactly, because this is an HPC system, SPMD. So all the code is pre-compiled and available on each node. So you don't need to send code. You just need to send the equivalent of an op code that can identify the lambda. I see, because I'm used to ACA programming where the yeah. message handler is defined in the actor and it's not sent with the message. Yeah, that was the earlier version that I had sent. I mean, this is two ways of looking at the same thing. But in high performance computing, as opposed to distributed computing, yeah, in distributed computing, you have different nodes, different domains of trust. You may have to send code and whatever, validate them. Here we have a high performance computing cluster. All nodes are loaded up with the same code. Everything is pre-compiled. So I think what I showed here earlier in line five is this explicit message handler. And what I'm showing here in line 30 is the implicit message handler with the lambda. But in our case, they're both equivalent. Okay, so the handler is technically sent from here, but it executes on the actor. Correct. It executes on the uh, receiving side, the destination. Receiving actor, yeah. yeah. So one other question, uh, is the difference between an async and an actor that the async can't receive messages while it's executing? No, I mean, in our extend model, when we had remote asyncs, it was a similar idea, except we did not uh, we did not have an implementation that was as finely tuned for these fine grain messages. When we were working I on thought the, I thought async, you started off with the parameters and then you can't message it further. Okay, maybe we'll take it off more offline if we get a chance, but I, I think in an earlier slide I showed, where was it? Uh, when I was talking about over here, right? You can see the slide, the yes. uh, second bullet. 
this async at was what we had in X10. So you say you send, uh, sorry, the two angle, right angle brackets, but async at a place, you send a body of a task. Now we're doing send to a place, the body of the task. It's basically the same thing. Okay. Uh, but the async will start with a new internal state, isn't it? Whereas actor maintains its internal state over oh, multiple messages. Uh, even in X10, the async uh, word can access global state outside its uh, local variables. Okay. okay. So okay. that part is the same. And even okay. here in the uh, Lambda, you can have local variables. You okay. know, like over here in line 31, that's a local variable. Okay. So, okay. thanks. Yeah. Yeah, sure. OK, so now I think this is uh, uh, many of your questions, which I really appreciate uh, forward reference. So I'll just give a high level overview because I guess I need to wrap up by one o'clock, right? Um, so very high level. So we have this habanero C runtime, which has uh, this idea of these. You can think each active message as a communication task in the conveyors library we use. I showed you what a programmer would need to do. They program to it directly. We don't expose that to the programmer. We use it under the covers in our runtime, and we have to do uh, interleave it with the computation. Okay, this, sorry, the formatting glitch over here, but um, the idea is this is a horizontal timeline loop, and at certain points, this is inside our runtime, and this the programmer needs to be aware of it. It's just like how when you do other systems programming, every time you have an entry point into, let's say, the kernel, some other actions can be taken. Similarly, of course, here this is all user level runtime. When a send is called, here I'm showing in lines 226 on the left hand side the implementation of send in our runtime. And within there, we will do things like, okay, if, if the buffer is full, right, we will then switch to a task. So then King Trip to ask, answer your earlier question, the context switching happens at those well-defined points. And then we switch to a task, initiate the communications, and then uh, resume the original code. So we have suspended tasks. Uh, the original main program would be suspended. You will uh, execute some uh, uh, communication active messages. Uh, then when the buffer becomes empty, you can resume the original task. And by the way, I mentioned, so if you go to hclib-actor.com, we tried to put together some tutorial. You could download even some uh, containers and just try and implement this as is in our, one of our releases. And if you get interested enough where you want to tweak the internals, just let me know and I'm happy to share that code with you as well. Okay. Um, very quickly, I think these were the bail kernels, uh, and uh, the papers I mentioned had some results. These are earlier results on the nurse query system, and uh, we're going to compare four versions: the UPC version, like the version I showed you earlier for index gather, the open shmem version, conveyors where the ninja programmer really gets good performance, but does a lot of low-level, uh, you know, API uh, management with what to do if the buffer is full and all the nested while loops and all of that. Uh, and our actor, what we call the selector version, which was the name we used for multiple uh, mailboxes. And these are all the version one, two, three were written by others. They're all available in the GitHub cited in our paper. Uh, and here I'm just showing results for these are really small kernels, as I mentioned, but our partners believe that if you do a good job here, you can do a good job on um, irregular applications. This is a histogram, like my Hello World example. A whole bunch of asynchronous sense for increment. You can see that blocking UPC version, while it's easy to write, and this execution time, so smaller is better. You know, if it, this went up to, we had more recent results with 64,000 PEs, this goes to 2K, you know, 44 seconds. The Schmem version is still five seconds, and the conveyor and the selector version are pretty uh, pretty much the same, and there are however many, like uh, 80 or uh, yeah, 70 times, uh, 60 to 80 times uh, faster. Weak scaling. Sorry? It's a weak scaling. This is weak scaling. I have some strong scaling results for something else coming up. Yeah, this is weak scaling. Because the uh, number of updates is per PE, so as you do uh, more PEs, you do more updates. Uh, and 
so on. It's amazing. For all of them, we see the same trend. And the paper has the details. So this actually, I would say, this is like triangle counting. You may have come across that for graph application as well. So this actually gave us, and uh, to be very frank, I wasn't expecting such a huge improvement just by software. The hardware is the same. But going back to the fact that there was so much idle time, uh, you know, this change of asynchronous runtime and so on was really, despite the runtime overhead of context switching and message aggregation, it was resulting in a big win. And now there are some more recent results. Um, actually, a PhD student of mine was in Bangalore in the first week of May for CC Grid. Uh, and as part of that, they have something called the Scale Workshop and the Scale Challenge where you submit. So this was uh, now results from one of the papers I mentioned earlier. Um, which actually got awarded the, uh, the, the the prize, which is a great reward for the PhD student who just completed his first year, Yusuf and Mogi. So we have results of PageRank and Jacquard Index. And now this is for more recent uh, supercomputer and nurse called Perlmutter. This has these AMD CPU, so 64 cores uh, for, for CPU and two, so 128 cores per node. Uh, and what, so we have for well, page rank, you can, so what here, what we're comparing is selector, which is our runtime version, which mem and UPC version. So the top left chart is execution time, so smaller is better. You can see, you know, the one order of magnitude plus improvement. Uh, the, uh, the bottom left is, so weak scaling. So continuing to that, you can see the throughput giga tests. And you can see with weak scaling that that's, yeah, sorry, the one on the left was log scale. The one on the upper right is uh, linear scale. So you can see uh, uh, good scaling over there. And for strong scaling, you can also see a factor of 10 plus improvement. Uh, so this is again very encouraging. So these are little more, these are still small kernels, but not as, perhaps as small and trivial as the bail kernels, but it showed that our improvements in the bail kernel can be exhibited here, and you can see the level of improvements over there. Uh, one of the things that we did was we also collected various hardware performance monitors, and maybe I just because I did, so these are hardware performance counters that many of you may be familiar with for like data cache misses, L1 data misses, uh, even I cache misses, PLV misses. Uh, the okay, the blue line. So the blue line is for selector runtime. The yellow line, in this case, is for Jacquard CTF, where my good friend Torsten Osler, DTH, this was the leading implementation of Jacquard coefficient. Um, you can see uh, for many of these, yeah, for all of these, I think, smaller is better. And you can see differences. We haven't had a chance to actually analyze why, but at least you've seen correlations with what contributes to performance. And we see significant, so the fact is, even though we're doing all this active messages, runtime, message aggregation, uh, we're getting, especially at this scale, fewer L2 misses, fewer L1 misses by significant factors. And even things like um, I, uh, instruction cache misses, uh, I think TLB, ITLB misses are lower. So it's still, yes, go ahead. Some of the graphs. Yeah. The uh, competitive approach actually starts off well, but when you scale the number of people, yes, exactly value. Right? Yeah. So that's a good comment that Govan made that it, uh, the changes would scale. And our belief is that the whole point of that going from synchronous to asynchronous, you see the benefit of asynchronous at larger scales, because if it's a smaller scale, the overheads of synchronous are, uh, are not that uh, uh, damaging as when you scale up. That's a high level belief. We have to figure out ways how to justify it. So this to me was also very interesting because it's not, I told my student, it's great you're more than 10x faster, but we need to understand why. Um, rather than uh, whether you're 10x slow or 10x faster, you still need to explain your results. So uh, anyway, I'm kind of out of time. So I just mentioned very, very briefly that we have started this exciting new project on software hardware co-design. I'm the PI for the project that started something uh, last September. 
And you can see a number of people, uh, some of my colleagues at Georgia Tech, like Tom Conte, Alex Douglas, Hyson Kim, um, and also outside Peter Kogi, who's been a leader in this near memory processing, processing in memory kind of space. And this is our sponsors, IARPA. Um, I think I'll just skip through a lot of this. Uh, this is now what we're doing is we're taking the actor model and saying, okay, how would we design hardware support for it? Um, and uh, this is the PGAS idea that you have a flat address space and you can, we have some notion idea of, called zones and you can distribute data structure according to zones and run actors within each zone. And uh, here are different algorithmic approaches. Again, I'm going quickly because of time. Uh, this is for top down. Scott Beamer, one of our partners, is one of the world's leaders in implementing breadth first search for Graph 500. He's got the top down, bottom up, interleave, uh, alternating, and all of that. And he's very excited by the actor model. He says, as a graph algorithm designer, this idea that you could implement an algorithm and for each vertex in a set, send something to another vertex. So that's a very logical way for him to think about graph algorithms. Uh, so just to, earlier I showed you, these are now explicit message handler for Jacquard coefficients. Uh, this is a, it also has a request response pattern. Here's the request code, uh, and you can see based on the, uh, you know, you have this package type. Uh, there are like four uh, uh, A byte quantities, uh, and so that's 32 bytes. And here uh, is the response. And you can see in the logic of the message handler in line 18, you have the response sent in the, in, for the request. You can have multiple responses. So it's a very flexible model. The breadth first search, you all know breadth first search, you usually have to test some local flag to see if it's visited. Uh, the message handler, message size here is just eight bytes. So that aggregation is very critical. So I said, you know, thousands of messages get aggregated. Um, and triangle counting is another example. The message size logically is 16 bytes. One of the things we want to do in our hardware design is have support for fine-grained messages where we don't need to do software message aggregation, and the hardware can help. So we're envisioning a hard, the, our project is called Forza. Uh, in this node architecture, we have all this fabric of near-memory processors, these RZAs that are called region zone accelerators. And uh, the idea is that actor messages get offloaded to each zone and the memory accesses get go through the same memory controller. Uh, with that, you don't you can have caching on the memory side, but you don't need any support for coherence. And you also don't need synchronization within a single actor thread. So um, and then uh, you know we've got some plans, I think, in terms of these different uh, well, these are accelerators. There's this, I think, somewhere. There's also the zone interconnect processor where we want to uh, that connects, uh, do some of this hardware support for message aggregation and so on. And uh, high bandwidth. So there are a number of challenges for graph algorithms. The Agile is the name of the program where we're doing this project. And here are the approaches we're taking. Both at the algorithm, not across the algorithm level, software level, and hardware level, these cashless scores, no coherence traffic, and so on. Uh, and then for programmability, even though we have the actor API, we have this future vision of automatically generating the actor code from the classic synchronous PGAS code as well, which I can talk to folks separately about. Um, yeah, and this is all done in the context of my Habanero group. Uh, we work on programming models, compilers, runtime, debugging. So I'm happy to discuss any of these topics with you. Um, and I think I'll just get a group photos. We're looking forward to visitors and uh, people who could uh, join our group. Hope to have King Shook here somebody later this year. Uh, and here are the current members of the group. I've been really lucky that there are three senior research scientists who moved with me from Rice University. And Jeff Young is a fourth who was at Georgia Tech. So they help uh, maintain continuity for my group even when PhD students graduate. And that's it. So to conclude, you know, this was all about motivation for uh, domain ex experts and uh, showing how we can extend the PGAS 
programming model. Our holy grail is that the compiler will automatically generate the asynchronous actor based code in the runtime will schedule the compute and data movement. And I think these are exciting types. Of course, there's a lot of activity in machine learning and there's more to be done there. In fact, we are doing some work on graph neural networks that would use traditional machine learning com combined with some of our actor based processing for graphs. Um, opportunities for new languages. We envision having a Python tool chain for this kind of approach. Um, and certainly new parallel hardware. And I think we can completely reimagine the software stack for high performance computing in given the space. So with that, I'm a few minutes over. So let me stop now. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Vivek, I had a question. Uh, Raghavan has a question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. OK, thanks. This The third bullet on the left, a compiler generates asynchronous actor based code. Uh, yes. From where or using what source would it generate? What is the? It, think of it as OpenMP. So something uh, we've got some. I've got some slides I can share with you if we meet separately, either today or uh, next week. Okay. Uh, so think of it as what we'd like to do is let a programmer write uh, threaded multi multi threaded code for shared memory, then distribute the data structures in distributed memory in PGAS. And use the compiler to automatically generate whenever there's activity in remote data, generate uh, the uh, actor send code and the message handlers. There, I had a comment. Yes. Uh, instead of uh, C with OpenMP, yeah. uh, I think some of the Python based uh, frameworks yeah. might be a good uh, sort of the higher level abstraction to target uh, yes. this one. And when I had a question here, instead of uh, perhaps uh, if the compiler wants to generate it, then it can be modeled as an IR. In a sense, uh, right. the abstractions that you have, if it can be modeled, for example, in MLR as some dialect and operations, then that could be a target for uh, some of the uh, higher level domain specific models to right. target. So for Python, I, uh, are you thinking about some like like they have for tensor operators that level, or are you thinking about some high level loops and data accesses? Uh, no, tensor level operators. Operate, operators, yeah. So yes, for that case, so this is part of the tension that we have. We also have work on, as I mentioned earlier very briefly, on optimizing tensor code. For example, we generate this Triton API from Python code uh, for GPUs on subkernel level, but that would still be confined to like a tensor expression like Taco takes. So we've shown how we can get better uh, performance and taco in some of our work last year. Uh, but we are talking to people like Scott Beamer and my colleague Rich Wooder. They also want to design new graph algorithms. So yes. when they design the graph algorithms like the breakfast search alternating and all, we cannot think of auto generating at least right now the algorithm from uh, tensor. Yeah, it need not be tensor based. Whatever is a convenient programming model for such graph based things in yeah. Python, I will take that one. Yes. And then with some annotations, like you know, like yeah. annotations, you can JIT compile those things by targeting this. Yes. So that would we should ask the domain expert what is the uh, what's the de facto uh, what's a good standard in Python to uh, program such graph based uh, things, and that would be a uh, yes, I totally. And my institution is based on what I is it two kinds of domain experts. So one is so one of the things we're also building that I haven't heard of is something called the actor graph library. You think you can think of it as a BLAS or something for graph algorithms. And that would be the more operator based approach because you're calling primitives. But the other people may be a smaller group, but they're still not hardware ninjas. They're graph algorithm experts who want to design these like I showed BFS for each vertex in the set do something. Uh, the, the operator version won't work for them, but they still want it at that high level. They don't want the C++ API. And I think last year when I spoke, I even talked about how we could generate C++. Yeah. So that is, those are the two uh, two uh, two, uh, two approaches: one operator based and one high level algorithmic uh, based. Yeah. I think both can be uh, supported. Yes, yes, so yeah, It yeah. doesn't have to be one specific. Exactly, and in fact, they can even be combined, which is what one of my PhD students is working on this year. He, uh, Tom Joe, he worked on the intrepid work that I presented last year, and he's also working on this operator fusion work. And we're going to put in the same tool chain so you can have code that's an intermingling of the two. So, 
Yeah, and you're absolutely right that MLR would be a great, for example, IR for this kind of work as well. Okay, more questions? Yes, go ahead. You talked about this whole thing being implemented on top of BGAS. Yeah. When you talk about BGAS, particularly for very large transfers, yes. Yeah. How efficient it takes to our what is the experience of that? So, the question is how efficient can you be in PGAS? So, I think some of the results I showed you indicate it all depends on how you program the PGAS. If you program it like at UPC, it can be very inefficient. Factors of 10 to 20 or 40 are inefficient. On the other hand, some of the colleagues whom we work with in our sponsor organizations, they're the ones who develop the conveyors thing. You know, they have to get a job done, so they're not waiting for any research to solve their programmable. They said, give us the lowest level API. You can think of it as a very poor man's PGAS because uh, they're really thinking of local memories, but this one property that I mentioned that Schmem has of a symmetric heap, you do a shared memory alloc, which is collective. Every PE has the same local address. So you can have code, you can send a message, and uh, you can have code where you send a local pointer from PE0 to PE2, and it would be meaningful in PE2 uh, and all of that. They get very good scalable performance, but they have to write I mean, just that request response thing required two nested while loops and uh, checking for uh, every API call you have to check for uh, if it returns false, you know, do that. So we see ourselves right now in between where we, the actor model delivers very close to their performance, but a little more approachable. And for some people, it's more approachable uh, than PGAS. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so with the that low level conveyors API, you can get the full performance for sure. Another question is this rendering asynchronous thing. Yeah. Uh, particularly when you scale. Yeah. I mean, from programmability point of view, that's going to be, I mean, of course, you mentioned that you will automatically generate the yeah. future, but until that time, that, uh, does it make programmability, programmability and other things? It could be. The question is, what's the alternative, right? If you have a really large machine, are you willing to use something that may be more programmable, but it uses the hardware at 0.0.1% efficiency? Or uh, so there's kind of the sweet spot. So we are figuring that, okay, some of our partners outside have said we're going for maximum efficiency, no matter how painful it is. We feel that while preserving comparable efficiency, we make things more uh, programmable and uh, it turns out, by the way, I've had experience, I think I mentioned many years ago that when I was at Rice University, I created a class on introduction to parallel programming for second year undergraduates. And we cover task parallelism, loop parallelism, and actors. The second year undergrad students love the actor model. They found something very appealing. And there are many like ACTA and the Scala community and all, they like it. Uh, so for some people, it may feel natural. I think JavaScript also has a notion of Message handlers and so on. So, uh, so we'll have to see. So, maybe a last question since we have uh, just three minutes. So, with all of this, you are basically targeting workloads in like, let's say, half minutes and all that. Yeah. In these workloads, one problem is that you don't have enough data. So, you sometimes right. get bounded by the memory bandwidth. Yes. Yes. And all this approach is about scalability. Yes. Scalability. How do you, like, how do you solve this? Memory bandwidth. Like I remember in our last conversation, we were talking about processing and memory. Yes. How much of this can be? Not just bandwidth, I would say latency. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that ties into our new FORSA project. That region zone accelerator that I mentioned is exactly a near memory processor. It's tied to the memory controller. And what happens today is the reason we have all these idle cycles is the relates to latency is that you know when you're waiting 10,000 cycles, the memory bandwidth is highly underutilized, which is also the, well, that 2017 PPDPS paper was saying that you know these irregular data analytics workloads highly underutilized. So yes, memory bandwidth is a very precious resource. And uh, certainly these approaches, our goal would be to maximize that. I think the memory bandwidth and network bandwidth are the two rate limiting resources we care about. I think on that note, finally, uh, 
I mean, you're reducing the idle time. Yeah. Uh, and as a result of this uh, process of waiting less. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it is a better load balance also. Yes. Like the, yeah, so load balance, actually load balance is a very interesting question because it does depend on how you distribute your data structures across PGAS, at least a simple actor model, right? Because you can think of this a little bit as another way of owner computes. You're sending the compute to, if you think of a distributed graph data structure, each vertex, if you distribute vertices, has a home location, like a PE. Now, uh, and uh, if you do edges might be irregular and there's some graphs where there could be a few vertices might have order of n edges and others might have constant number of edges. If you have the misfortune of putting those uh, super nodes with order of n edges on the same PE, you will have a load imbalance. And that's something that current algorithm designers already are aware of. So you figure out the data distribution to reduce that load imbalance. Yeah, so that, that that problem, to me, I consider that also an algorithmic issue. So let's again thanks, Valerie. Yeah, sorry. thank you. Thank and I will be available after 2 p.m. at 2.30, I think. Yeah, I think 2.30 is available for any discussion. You can send me an email. Thank you. And Raghavan, thanks to you and others for joining remotely. So we have again. Gift from CSA. Thank you very much. Of, uh, <laughs> Thank you. CSA Thank collection. you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you.